play. And another, another foul on Ward. His third for setting a screen. Because of physical play, although George Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Pick and roll. And a foul. Offensive foul coming up again. Battle box getting it right there. So Hello, everyone, and welcome to a postseason edition of the Moving Screen Podcast. I'm Brendan Quinn of The Athletic. I'm here with Dylan Burkhart, UM Hoops. Um, Dylan is home and looking well-rested and spry. I am still in Minneapolis. Uh, right you're, down still the wire, sta- you're still standing, though. Right down to the wire. The, the extra five minutes was a nice touch. You uh, you made it through the whole year. That's I'm impressed. Good. You're still good. standing. It was good. A little overtime action in the final four never hurt anyone. It was a hell of a scene, man. That was a hell of a scene. The, the building was uh, was just on edge in a way that uh, I mean, it's hard to describe. I mean, you've been in those places, you know, when it's it's just well, it's a totally different vibe and feeling to be with seventy five thousand people watching a basketball game. Um, and it's, uh, man, if I, I would recommend it to anyone out there, like all you fellow hoop heads, it's just, it is one of those bucket list things. Like you gotta go to a final, even if your team's in it or not, like you gotta go to a final four at some point in your life and just kind of see these things. And, uh, yeah, last night's game was, uh, in defiance of those who said that, uh, the game was going to be yeah, bullshit. I, uh, I was led to believe that it was right. doomed. We shouldn't even play it. No one's going to watch. All right. Right, I'll be, I, be a pretty good game. I will be a little bit curious to see the ratings. They're out. It was a twelve point four. Was that good? It was better than last year's. Although last year's was on TBS, which is a key distinction. That is a but key it was it was in a solid area. It wasn't some sort of precipitous drop just off a by any stretch. Right. Well, that's good. I'm glad people watch it because the game was awesome and uh, Virginia is tougher than hell. Texas Tech's tougher than hell. Um. We will start this week because we didn't really do any kind of wrap with Michigan State. We're, we're just going to touch on uh, on the end of what was a pretty amazing season there and then uh, move into a a long list of mailbag questions that we will just kind of rip through here before I got to hit my late checkout of this hotel. And then uh, we will tie a bow on this thing. So um, your impressions from afar on uh, – on the end of Michigan State's season, and then I'll kind of tell you what I saw from uh, here here in the uh, trenches. It was a bit of a – it felt awfully familiar to what I saw in Anaheim in a lot of ways, and it really just kind of cemented for me how good Texas Tech's defense really was. I mean, that uh, they held Michigan State to uh, – I think it was their worst offensive performance by a long shot – and their offense obviously is flawed, but they just figured out how to get buckets, and Matt Mooney went crazy there for a bit. Uh, but I just think that it comes down to that defense, which is one of the more impressive defenses I think I've seen in quite some time. Yeah, what I mean, did you see on the ground out there? I mean, I had a Michigan coach tell me the next day after Michigan lost to him, like, man, this was that was just the worst possible matchup. Like, what we do versus what they do, like, it just – it couldn't have been a worse matchup for us. And I think it was the same exact thing for Michigan State. Um, probably not a coincidence. And, I mean, you make you make 15 shots in the national semifinals. It was the fewest shots that they made in a game since 2012. Um, you know, Izzo thought it had a lot to do with uh, the matchup, but also um, thought guys were worn out. And they were. I mean, like Matt McQuaid, I don't know what. The guy was just dead in the first half and the early foul trouble to Aaron Henry kind of threw things off early. Um, And I I wouldn't say, I I thought Michigan state was going to win the whole thing. So full disclosure, like coming into the week, I I thought that they were going to get two wins and, uh, and actually do this thing. But um, after like the first 10 minutes of watching that game, like Texas tech is just something else to see um, in person. And that, that even made, Virginia's win, I, I think all the more impressive was, you know, you're talking about a team that knocked out uh, Mich- uh, John Beeline, 
Mark Few, and Tom Izzo in three straight games. Quite a uh, run. I mean, that's that's crazy. So um, all the credit in the world there. But um, I don't think it should take away from what uh, Michigan State did this year. Um, that was a hell of a team. Finished the year top 10 in both offensive and defensive efficiency. Um, I think this was the year that uh, Cassius Winston kind of entered into a very different conversation. I, I wrote this uh, the coming out of the game, but like I was just blown away the day before the semifinals. He's up on having a press conference, and uh, Matt Charbonneau from the Detroit News asked um, Tom a question that basically put Cassius in the same conversation as Magic Johnson and Mateen Cleves, as just these winning point guards who are just kind of transcendent type guys. And if you get to that level, what does it mean? And blah, 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 blah. And as he's asking the question, Cassius is sitting next to Izzo and just kind of like, bends his head from left to right, like just kind of like cracked his neck, like no big deal as his name is put there with, with magic and, and Mateen. And, uh, this was, things are different for that guy now. And I'm not, I, I assume he will test the waters. Uh, I think he should go through the process. I also think he will be back. Um, but when we had a, a long conversation, um, I walked with him from the locker room to the team bus and he's like, man, I'm not even in good shape. I don't like my legs. You know, I got I to gotta take my game to the other level, and I think I can do that. And I'm like, you know, you were like a second-team All-American. He's like, I can be a lot better. So um, it would be really interesting to see. Last year, Winston had this sort of record-level efficiency, and looking at it just pure, purely numerically, it was like, why can't he use more possessions, and mm-hmm. how much will his efficiency decrease with more usage? This year, he pretty much proved that he can still be maybe not earth-shatteringly efficient, but still ridiculously efficient. And he used seven, he used 30% of possessions this year compared to 23% a year ago. That's a crazy increase, yeah. and he still he just got better. And I think we finally saw what Michigan State can look like as a team when you go all in on him being the guy. And I think that really kind of you have to remember that wasn't the case all year. So what does that look like over the course of a, a whole season? I mean, that it's who even knows, right? Like the ceiling of that look, if you're just going to say we're a spread ball screen team around Winston and Xavier Tillman, like that's a completely different team for yeah. an entire season. Which and they, is scary and they, to the rest of the country. And they get to spend all summer, like just doing, like just working on the stuff that will, cause they kind of figured it out a little bit as they went along this year. Right. For sure, and, without a doubt. And now they kind of know what winning basketball looks like under this current version. So you get to spend an off season doing that. And you're right. The, the, the point on the numbers is really interesting. Like he's not, I don't think he's going to be a guy who's going to go out and average 26 and 11 next year. Like just this do everything on every possession point guard. Like the numbers could be very similar ish. But he could just even be more efficient if that's possible. Um, the quote that he said to me that jumped out was, it's going to be a change, another big jump that I can do. The numbers might not be as crazy and those types of things just because we've got more players, things like that. But I'm still going to have that kind of impact. So I think he's, I think he understands himself differently as a basketball player after the last year. And uh, it'll be... Um, something to see, to see uh, or to watch how that unfolds. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Like, at this point, you can't really, like, uh, the knock was always right. His defense, his defense, his defense. Well, he played just about every minute for this team that was a top 10 defense and went to the Final Four. The, and this not Jaron Jackson back there, anything like that. I mean, they had a good defense all around, but I don't think that's a big weakness. Like, what is his weakness going into the next year, right? I mean... He's got to be a favorite for National Player of the Year, right? Yeah, I mean, if Grant Williams is back at Tennessee, he would be in the conversation. Um, I don't know enough about, like, I don't think there's any Zions coming in um, or anyone of, I mean, I'm sure there's another flock of great freshmen, but I don't know if there's anyone of that caliber. Um, Yeah, I mean, i got to think everyone else that would be in the conversation is going pro. Like, Carson Edwards is already gone and done. Um, So... Yeah, I think it'll be the preseason favorite, if not 
co with 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 Grant Williams. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's. I think he's going to go through the draft process, and they will say, you know, you you got to get in better shape, right? You got to just be a little bit more explosive. You got to get maybe better legs. You know, get a little bit of maybe a. a a little bit of definition in your arms at some point. Like, I still don't think Cassius has lifted a weight in his life. Um, so there's going to be things like that. Um, but, like, in terms of just with the ball, he could probably cut it back his turnovers a touch. Um, but, damn, I mean, Which the, the guys, he did this yeah, year, right? He, he did over the course of the year. I mean, he year. dropped his turnover rate 5% from this right. year to what from last year. There was that game in mid-February – was it mid February or so at Illinois when he had like nine or ten turnovers or something like that? Um, but yeah, I mean, he tightened everything up, and uh, we'll see, we'll see. But they, uh, if, if if they lose Nick Ward, which I think there's a good chance they do, um, but everyone else is back, and you're adding um, um, Rocket Watts, and I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on somebody else. Everyone can just yell at their right at their car radio. Know, so it's the God, shit. I know the kid's name. <laughs> All right, whatever. I mean, it's going to be a loaded. It's a loaded roster. Um, losing Matt McQuaid is going to hurt. Kenny Goins is going to hurt. Um, mainly because you know, Malik they, Hall. Malik Hall. Thank you. It's, and Julius Marble. It's um. It is. Not super easy, I think, to just replicate what Kenny did. Um, people don't talk about the fact that he led the Big Ten in rebounding. Um, his three-point shooting was uh, a turning point in the season, um, or part of the turning point of the season. That I don't know if they just have a you know natural guy to plug in and suddenly be that pick and pop guy, and you know you're going to have to kind of mold this thing or remold this thing around. Cassius, but yeah like look at McQuaid and Goins are basically stars in the roles like yes. as best you can possibly be right they give you everything that you could want on the defensive end of the court in terms of reliability McQuaid was one of the best perimeter defenders in the country and they hit threes those are the basically the perfect I guess mm-hmm. mesh players yeah now you're looking at what do you make of kind of that middle section of the rotation where you have maybe higher ceilings but lower floors potentially in terms of consistency and all that. Yeah. And I've like, I have no idea what to make of a guy like Josh Langford. Yeah. It's, we all know what Josh Langford is and what he's, what he could be, but you know, what, what this actually looks like next year. And you're throwing darts if you're making any kind of projection of what, of what he is. And it'll be interesting to kind of see him in a, um, in that more secondary role um it was interesting talking to some guys before uh the semifinals and looking back on when Michigan State scrimmaged Gonzaga here in Minneapolis um in the preseason and them talking about Langford being almost as ball dominant as Winston was in that game and you're just like you like fall out of your chair you know remembering of what this team actually looked like you know Nick Ward had 14 shot attempts in that game while Matt McQuaid went 0 for 3. Um, I think Kenny attempted one three-pointer. It was just a completely different team five months later. So to make any projections in April on April 9th um, is pretty pretty damn hard. But they certainly have all the pieces to get right back here. Um, well, not here. It'll be in Atlanta next year, which will be um, nice because the weather here did not cooperate for most of the time. <laughs> yeah, Langford is really fascinating to me as mm-hmm. far as he was – really the least efficient rotation player when he played offensively, but he used a big chunk of those shots, right? And how does that play off of Winston? And do you rebuild his role in a way that Mm -hmm. he's playing more as basically in McQuaid's role? Or do you still kind of run all that action that you used to run through him, right? I mean, that's a really tricky – there's some tricky situations, I think, to figure out the best solution to when you – figure out how you're going to approach the next year. It is. It is. And 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 Aaron Henry's going into next year as an NBA prospect. Um, you know, the the other pieces beyond Winston, Langford, Tillman are fascinating because Aaron Henry could be a star and I think 
guys like Gabe Brown and Marcus Bingham, like who know? Like what do you even pre- predict there? Who who knows? They all they are just they have so much ability and potential and length. You know, if those guys are playing major minutes, this is a, that's a long team um, that would be a, that could give some really interesting looks. Um, things that like you haven't really seen from um, a Michigan State squad. Um, and then Xavier Tillman. Um, I, I, Xavier Tillman might be a pro. And he will be the best defensive uh, or maybe one of the two best defensive centers in the or five men in the league. Um, and his offensive game is expanding and expanding and expanding. And um, Can we just talk about him going three of four from – Three over the last yeah. week and a half after going five of, uh, like, 23 for the first uh, yeah. whole season. Is he going to have a little uh, Kenny Goins shooting breakout Eight. coming up who, next Who year? knows, man? What does a lineup with Bingham at the five and Tillman as a four-man look like? I would be curious to see that in, uh, you know, when next year kind of reaches its mid-Big Ten season. You know, they're not going to start with that look because Bingham's not going to be ready to play bulk minutes in the first week, but I could see him growing into something. What do you make of – so Tillman was fantastic and has been really good. The one thing he's not that Michigan State has almost always had is kind of a go-to guy with his back to the basket. Do you think mm. they tried to bring that out of him? I or does he so. stay as kind of this pick-and-roll, roll, dive, slip? Like, if you think about his offensive game, obviously he'll, like, seal and transition some and score, but – it's still very different than Nick Ward in terms of you're not really running your system to pound the ball into him in the post. Do you agree with that assessment? Do you think he, do you think his game changes to do more of that? Or is he just this player who can score almost entirely out of the pick and roll, which isn't a bad thing. No, it's not a bad problem to have. Um, I think, I think they work with him on it and they want it as an option. I don't think they, they work on it with the intent of like, this is what we're going to be. But, um, I mean, this, it's still Michigan State basketball. Yeah, because Michigan State basketball, that's like one of the right. first things you think of is playing out of the post. Right. And uh, and he can pass. Like, he's not, you know, and there was, it's looking back on his freshman year, you know, I thought he was kind of one of these guys with stone hands who couldn't really do, and he's got these great soft hands, actually, and uh, he does have a great feel for the game. Um, so I, I think they'll work on it, and I think he's more than capable of it, for sure. I mean, he's got the footwork developing um he 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 does his his touch um with both hands is getting softer and softer um you know if you if he can take three dribbles with his left hand and go score at the rim he can catch a post touch on the block and turn and finish right yeah so the synergy stats nick ward 79th percentile as a post up scorer Tillman, 33rd percentile. Wow. So there's a big there's a big wow. gap in those. But that, I think, I guess, would you rather, if you were coaching Michigan State, have Tillman become a pick-and-pop guy who can shoot 35% from three or a go-to guy in the post who you can throw the ball into 10 times per game and be kind of a multidimensional threat? Like, I just, I'm just really I would fascinated rather to see have where his the, game goes. I would rather have him as a pick-and-pop guy. I think Michigan State would rather have him a little closer to the basket. There were a lot of, there were the, some of the threes that Tillman attempted this year were met with um, a level of horror on the sideline. And yes, he is capable of making them, but um, I think he's earned the trust to take it and not get taken out of the game immediately. But um, I still think they'd rather identify as Michigan state basketball. Interesting. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting, though, to see how that'll play out, I think. For sure. That's a great point. Um, can we uh, – let's get to the mailbag. You want to get into the mailbag? Yeah, let's do it. Um, moving screen pod ended by Texas Tech in both brackets. We got to start a Texas Tech podcast. <laughs> Raider power. Oh, geez. That's right. Lubbock was, um, while you're pulling up those questions, man, Lubbock was in the house this weekend. My God. Throwing tortillas or something like that? Throwing tortillas. They Someone almost clipped me with a tortilla when I was walking yeah, into this. I, I have a question here that says, why do you hate tortillas? I don't hate, I love a nice tortilla. 
Um, I don't like when they're thrown at me by a drunk Texan from across the street in front of a bar. Um, I threw him a one finger salute and I, I actually, I immediately regretted it cause I thought he was going to run across the street and try to try to throw down right there on in, in front of a bar on a, in front of the stadium, which would have not been, uh, <laughs> it would have ended your season <laughs> short. It would have been a highlight of the season. All right. What do you got, brother? All right. We've got from Plez 33. Does Texas Tech's run to the national title game? This is before the outcome. Change your interpretation of Michigan's loss to them in the Sweet 16. Um, no. I mean, I picked them to lose to Texas Tech. I thought it was a bad matchup all along. Um, the offense, I, I saw it being um, the thing that would ultimately be the undoing and um, proved to be that when you lack shot makers. And sometimes, and if you play an elite defense, sometimes it's going to be hard to win. Um, what does that mean in terms of like looking at the actual program and things like that? I, I don't know, but I don't, I, I don't think a year or two from now I'll be like, man, remember when they blew that shot against Texas Tech? Um, that was a hell of a team. That they lost to. Yeah, I don't think it changes anything that I thought back when they lost that game. I think that it does prove that uh, well, so much of making a run comes down to your draw, right? And they obviously they play one of the five or six best teams in the country in the Sweet 16, which says something. I get like for all the complaints about Michigan State's draw, it was actually Michigan's draw that ended up being tougher considering who they had to face earlier in the tournament. Yep. Um, which I guess do we give like a brownie point to the committee or something for that? But because Texas Tech, all the numbers said they were one of the best teams in the country over the last two months, and they definitely proved it. Mm-hmm. I don't know that if you shouldn't really be basing, I guess, how you feel based on like if they would have lost the next. I don't know. It just doesn't change that much in the grand scheme of things. Agree um, for me. Agree. Um, and to your point. I kind of came more and more to the realization that um, Michigan State get being in in Duke's region um, was one of the better things that could have happened to it because you, you were probably going to have to beat that Duke team. You know, at, there's a chance. If you wanted to go win a national championship, there was a sound chance you were going to have to run into Duke. Um, and it's probably a better chance to play Duke on a Sunday than a – Saturday in the Final Four. I'd rather play them in an arena in Washington, D.C., where it's more of just a game, right, as opposed to one of these things where it is just a completely different spectacle. And, you know, uh, freshmen are don't know what the hell's going on. And um, yeah, Can I think you imagine? You're good to get them early. Zion... In the final four, man, uh, C- CBS executives just sobbing a... somewhere. It would have just been a show like no other. And all other media there would have been hating their lives. It would have been crazy. All right, this is from Jared Colbush. If Michigan State could Jared have played Colbush. Oh, I thought Jared Colver was checking in on the pod saying, what about, what now? If Michigan Ooh, State me. could have played with <laughs> one player on Michigan in the game versus Texas Tech, who would they choose? If Michigan State could have one guy from Michigan? Yep. Against Texas Tech. It's tough. Yeah, I mean, it's not like anyone from Michigan just, played well against Texas Tech. It's not like Michigan could score against Texas yeah, Tech either. Right, right. Um, I don't even know where you go. Uh, I don't. Maybe, maybe a guy like Charles? Isaiah Livers? Give him some shooting? Some size? Although Isaiah Livers didn't play particularly well against them either, yeah. so that's a tough. They might just. I would say Matthews, just because his size, strength, and versatility is one of the fewest, one of the few things that could actually match up with. That was the striking thing about seeing Texas Tech. It's just those are just. It's just an army of just big, strong. Like they are strong guys. They all they all look like men. You know, I can't imagine what it was like there in person to see like a guy like JP standing next to some of the guys from. Texas Tech, well, where you're like, okay. To be that... fair, Moretti is not really the most uh, imposing cat on the okay, roster. Well, uh, one guy. But, like, even the guy like Mooney is, like, no. his arms and shoulders. Like, he's built like a man, you know? And they are they are adults. <laughs> and the way that they 
uh, can be so aggressive defensively and then recover with their length yeah. is really – it's fascinating. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Um, that was what really stood out when you see them in person. It's just how quickly they can get back on you with that length. Mm-hmm. All right, we got one from ZB. Assuming the pipe dream of Xavier and Teske becoming 35% three-point shooters falls through, what is the most important other improvement each of them can make next season? I just want to add something to this. Xavier Simpson becoming a 35% shooter would amount to him making four more threes this year. So hmm. is, you have to remember that with some of these percentages is that it's a pretty fine line. But on the same token... If he missed four more threes, he'd be a 25% three-point shooter. So I think he... I think it's more the question of, of being a volume three-point, you know, a capable volume three-point shooter. Yeah, so I agree that he needs to become more of a shooting threat. I'm just saying, like, to call it a pipe dream seems a bit right. harsh, right? You're talking about four more threes for either of these either of these guys who shot around... Every made three is about a percentage point, a little more mm-hmm. for Teske because he only attempted 77. Mm-hmm. So that's something to consider. But what would you say, I guess, to this question? Um, for Teske, I would probably say, uh, number one, um, being in, I'd say, endurance, is being in better condition, better, um, you know, just if you can add, like, just a little bit of athleticism, mobility, things like that. Um I think he'd be more capable player. Um, I think skill wise, he probably not is what he is. I mean, he's you know he's talking about a twenty one year old guy. Like he can get better, of course, but like I uh, I just don't know if he's just gonna, like what things he's just going to magically implement. But I do think he can be even better conditioned. Um, and I and I am I wrong there? You're well, making- on conditioning, I was gonna say <laughs> I think it will help him to have a backup. Mm-hmm. Like, I th- I feel like he had to – he played a lot of minutes, sure. 75% of minutes in Big Ten play. Having a reliable backup can maybe give you a more of a, like, effort level whenever you're on the court, right? Sure. Like, I think there was certainly a level of pacing yourself to his game. I think for him, being able to seal and finish effectively, like, down low against a mismatch or a switch or in transition is kind of like the one mm. gap in his game, right? Like – he would kind of get in those positions at times. He didn't quite always establish himself, didn't always finish well. He had some of those kind of awkward finishes around the rim. I think he can improve in that regard. Would you have any interest in him having a little a little bit of back-to-the-basket game? I think that he needs to be able to catch the ball with his back-to-the-basket against someone much smaller than him and lay the ball in. Yeah. I don't think that you're going to just throw the ball in there as he's playing against uh, another big guy. Hold on. I think I got a hotel trying to kick me out of my room. Hold on. You need to check the status before tossing me oh, out of here. Geez. <laughs> All right. Next question. Wait. What about Simpson's improvements? Oh, Simpson's. Oh, we forgot about Xavier. I think for Xavier, it all comes down to shooting. He does basically everything else. Well, I don't I, know. it would be nice if he could go to his left a little bit. Yeah, and like I feel like we never really talked about that all year, right. and then it was really magnified against Texas Tech. But the thing about him always going to his right is that he always got to his right. True. Except against Texas Tech. True. So I don't know. That's that's it. I've been I was actually thinking about that the other day because that's just like the kind of thing I think of. <laughs> and uh, normal. <laughs> so few teams are going to defend ball screens like that because Michigan picks and pops so much mm-hmm. and they're not Texas Tech and they can't always recover to that. So I don't know. It'll, it'll be interesting. Like, I don't know. Will teams start icing every Michigan ball screen next year? It could happen. We've it seen could. that kind yeah. of change like the seasons after how teams have guarded them in the past. That would be like a throwback to when Trey Burke was at Michigan and everyone forced everything to the side and kind of made him do that. But that was before Michigan ever had a, Pick and pop. So you you would go with him going left more. I mean, obviously, shooting is the the conversation starts there. But um, I thought the question was kind of prefaced with beyond. beyond I know. That. So I would say I'd say yeah, um, just some more versatility with him as a as a ball handler within within the half court. 
That's fair. All right. What else you got? You're, you're on question duty here because my mentions are a mess because of the game last night. Yeah, no, I got you. Next up <laughs> is from, from Mark. He says, Marcus Bingham weighs 10 more pounds than Tariq Owens. Same height. But beyond their size and strength changing dramatically, can he make an impact next year? Or is it Kithier and Tillman with zero depth? Well, no, I mean, I think you should have expectations for Marcus Bingham next year. Um, he's still the guy on this team. Uh, Aaron Henry's kind of making things interesting, but he's he's been the guy on this team for most of the year that um, NBA folks have kind of had the most curiosity and interest in. Um, he just wasn't physically ready to go this year, and I, he's put on some weight, um, but it doesn't look like he's put on a lot of weight, and I, he is actually one of those guys that I wonder you know, how much he can even put on and, and keep on. Um, it seems like how I, much I, does he need? Like you no, don't have to be, I mean, he's crazy thin. Like I, he could just be physically overpowered right now by someone who's giving up six inches. If he would have played in that Texas Tech game, he would have gotten snapped in half. Um, so he does just, you, you still do need to be able to, even if you're not a back to the basket on the blocks pounding it guy, you still need to be able to hold your space there. That's why, that's why John Teske is kind of what he is. He's he can anchor himself back there. Um, you know, Bingham needs to be able to do that, but he can shoot threes. Um, he has a high level skills. Um, he's going to play next year, and impact wise, I have no idea. But like I said, his length, um, he can make up space defensively. He can give him a shot blocking presence. Um, he can do pick and pop. He, I think he needs to um, work on his understanding of the game, understanding of the system, where to be, what to do, what what his role actually looks like, and that's a process. But um, put it this way: most people at Michigan State still don't th- don't think that Marcus Bingham is a four year player. Fair enough. That pretty yeah, pretty much he should have a way higher ceiling than Kenny ever did. It's just there might be some growing pains along the way, right? He, That's he has, how I kind of look at it. a much higher ceiling than most of the roster, most of the current roster. Fair enough. This is the question that I need the answer to. This is from Ryan Walker. Masters prediction. Ooh. This is all oh, I really baby. care about. I've moved on. We've got Champions League today. We've got Masters this week. College basketball is in the, in the back burner now. Are you looking for like a value odds pick? I mean, don't just come out here and say Rory, and that would be not great. You need to give someone some little bit of room to work with. He just has master's predictions, though, so let us know how it's going to go. It's hard. Um, I I always feel like Justin Thomas should play really well on this course, and I feel like as he's done, uh, as he's finally gotten a few masters under his belt, I think he's... The more he plays there, the more he's due to win one. So I think if I had to take, you know, one of the big names of your your DJ, Rory, Spieth, that whole group, Kepka, um, I'd probably take JT. Um, that'd be my that'd be my top pick. Um, I don't know. Cooch is always right there. Um, Tiger won't win. DJ won't win. Uh, Justin Rose? Spieth, maybe? Yeah, I saw him. I like Justin Rose. Rose has a, he was actually, I think he's like 14 to 1. 14 to 1. Yeah, that's a good, that's a pretty good value pick. Um, What about uh, Kepka, 25 to 1? Bryson, 25 to 1? Bryson has had, I think he's played really well at Augusta. Um, I just can't stand him, so I would never pick him. Um... (laughs) <laughs> is that is that all right? Am I allowed to say that? Is, I think the last like a uh, few Masters, it's been someone at least twenty to one who's ended up winning. Right. It. Let me pull up the. Uh, let me get a Paul Casey. Get twenty. Paul Casey can play, man. Let me get you, let me get a a little bit of a sleeper. Yeah, no, the, I like I like those names. A sleeper me pick would Rose, be... Kepka, Bryson, and Casey. Lock it in. Wow. Just coming right with the heat, baby. Four picks. Um, Kevin Kisner at sixty to one is pretty good. Um, Sneds has always has been there a number of times. Uh, he's at eighty to one. 
Uh, Kucher at forty to one. I'm surprised he's that high. Hasn't he been playing well? Yeah. He's been making a lot of friends. I know that much. Yeah, right. All right. Just don't ask him for a couple bucks. Um, how about Patrick? How about the defending champion at sixty to one? Yeah. Good luck with that one. No, I wouldn't touch that. Um, yeah, but this is why I'll, people I'll listen go, to the pod for our master stakes. I'll go JT. Who would be like your if you had to pick the guys like sixteen to one and lower? Oh, I said my other one would be Fleetwood. Sorry. Okay. Fleetwood, I like Rose. Fleet, Fleetwood will win a Masters in the next five years. Rose, Kepka, Bryson, Casey. Rose, Kepka. That's my four pack. I'm not feeling Kepka at all. Okay. It's a bad course for him, but all right, that was good. I like you're this. the expert. I like this. Now we're talking. Now we have this. Now we can for all the people who are asking what we're going to do in the off season on the we're pod. pivoting to golf. <laughs> Well, I literally am pivoting to golf. I'll be covering some golf this summer for the athletic for some people who don't know. But Breaking news. There you go. We're still figuring out what it's going to look like, so don't go too crazy. <laughs> All right. This is from Rob Ignatowski. By the way, we didn't even mention Fra- Francisco Molinari, who's been playing like as well as anyone in the world over the past 18 I, months. I, but, see, you're uh, doing this thing where you're just dropping more names at the lab. You're going to try to go back on this sorry. and say that you uh, – no, no, picked no. it all along. I'll, I'll, I'll ride the horses. I said, okay. Go ahead. All right. What percent of Michigan State's turnovers this year were offensive fouls? Also, what <laughs> Big Ten team had the most offensive fouls this year? I wish I read this before because I actually could have looked this up. Well, just hit pause but, and pull up the data. But uh, we'll 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 come back to that um, <laughs> later in the uh, in the pod. Here you go. This I'm curious for your take on this. Will Izzo and Beeline die on the auto bench hill? We need your auto bench takes once and for all. I mean, Beeline's not changing. There's no – Beeline's not changing. I could see Izzo. Maybe. Maybe. John, no chance. Do you think – I guess and I – I have no it, problem with it, really. At it more, like, yeah, what do you – do you think that it'll – I mean, I guess you could say it probably – people would say it already has cost them at different points. But uh, do you think that it's a mistake? Like, where would you? where do you kind of – so Fall in line with it. The thing that I don't get with John sometimes is when it's a player that I am fully confident can play without fouling. Um, if it's someone who's just unreliable or, or will be out of position and pick up a foul um, or swat a guy, you know, like I get like if, if Teske does something, you got to pull him out, you know, because there is a chance that he's still going to bring his hand down on a time where he just can't commit a foul. And, and hit you with a third. Um, a guy like Xavier Simpson, I wouldn't auto bench ever. Um, he can play without fouling. He knows what he's doing. Um, but it, it is interesting that it's it's not really personnel driven. It is just hard and fast. Um, what do you think? I I agree that there should be some sort of. Uh, sometimes you have to maybe bend, right? Like. Yeah. I don't know that – I agree, like Simpson. Sorry, I'm looking up this offensive foul stat. <laughs> Doing the Lord's work. Um, I only have 80 offensive fouls for Michigan State this year, which now we need to find That's their turnovers. Over two a game. Yeah, and I'm like a, a high number is up like 3-4. I mean, Texas Tech drew like 3.5 per game. Hmm. So Michigan State turnovers – this is people need this. They need to know how many uh I know turnovers we got. 428, so that would be 19% of Michigan State's turnovers were offensive fouls. Yeah. And a lot of those were on brand as moving screens. I don't Absolutely. have those stats, but <laughs> they're doing it for the brand. Yeah. How about Nick Ward checking into the Texas Tech game and immediately committing a moving screen? Was there audio of that? Was there Jim Nance dropping a moving screen? I'm sure we'll have to update the uh, intro yeah. music ASAP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where did my questions go here? Well, the final point on the, the auto bench is the reason I don't – like. I feel like I, – I do appreciate the fact that like coaches who just you, – you have your principles and like this is, what, this is what we do and this is how we do it and everyone knows what to expect. Um, the players know what to expect. The staff knows what to expect. 
Um, there's something to be said for that. Now, it's easier to be that way when you have 800 career wins or 600 career wins or multiple Final Fours and things like that. So, it's I look at I think you have to be able to look in the mirror and change though. I mean, sure. You look at Chris Beard last year; they had a little more depth. He ranked 291st in two foul participation. So he never played guys with two fouls. This year, not as much depth, maybe more experience, whatever. 19th. They played guys with two fouls all the time in the first half. So I think there's really something to be able to look and say, yeah, I might believe this way or I've done this in the past, but I'm going to change at some point. Like he had been 291, 274, 288. His three years in D1. I feel like those changing things like that are different than changing foul policies. That is foul policy. That's what I'm talking about. I missed your point. He (laughs) never played guys with two fouls in his three years as a D1 head coach. This year, he played guys with two fouls all the time. Hmm. It. I just found it an interesting fact because you you would think of that stat as something that coaches are pretty much set in their ways, right? And to see that he completely changed that is interesting. I don't know if they I don't I'm not a really expert on Texas Tech basketball, but I'd be curious if they lost games because of foul trouble previously mm-hmm. or what. But it's just interesting to see someone change that dramatically with something that seems to really be like a right. and and personal and beard is not like reference Beard is not like some 34-year-old head coach either who's just kind of figuring out his way of doing things and that. I mean, he's, uh, he's, 40, no, he's been 40, around the... 46 years old. You know, he, he's coached a lot of basketball at a lot of different levels. Um, he's not Richard Pitino. He is not Richard He's Pitino. not learning on the job. Right. No, he's been a coach since 1991. He was, he was a GA at Texas. All right. What else? Fair enough. Have? So... I got it's an interesting point. It's, it's something for them to both be asked. Yeah, how, how does Beeline adjust to more ISO ball if teams keep switching screens? Yeah, My answer is pretty I, simple I, I would, for this. I, I would ask you. I would recruit better ISO players. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I think you have to – you can make changes, but you can only make so many changes. It is really something that comes down to being able to beat the guy across from you and – Michigan wasn't always great at that this year, and that turned out to be a problem. I don't know that it requires some sort of crazy change in what you do. I don't know. Where do you do, would from? you would you say that Jalen Wilson and Cole Bajama and Zeb Jackson are higher level ISO players than what they have been bringing in? I think they're. They don't have, they don't lack potential in those regards. I don't know that, it, I don't know that Michigan hasn't done a good job of bringing those players in. It was sort of just a weird situation this year. I think, say Jordan Poole can become a lot better ISO player. It's not like he mm-hmm. can't become a better ISO player. You have to probably prioritize one on one scoring you and do. really figure you- out that that's going to be a big part of your offense. Like, yes, you spend all this time drilling the ball screen, making the ball screen reads. But at a certain point, you're going to have to work on beating your guy one-on-one and creating leverage. And that is something that I think Michigan always knows is important, but it's been magnified over the last three years. Like, it, And it's – you talk they, – they, Michigan talks so much about time and how t- their time is spent in the offseason, right? They, everything is calculated to the minute. And it's skill development and it's skill development and it's skill development. Well, like – the skill development that's in place is built to address the things that Michigan does. So if they're going to go to more ISO stuff, which I do think probably needs to be addressed in some way or another, it's also a matter of time of the work being spent on that. So um, you know, developing guys in those roles is also something that is is different than just being like, hey, you got the talent, we're just going to put you out here on this side and you just go play one-on-one basketball. It, it ain't going to be that. It'll never be that. Yeah, without yeah, it's with, without a doubt. Spending time and getting to that point to be more effective. All right, let's see what we've got here. 
Losing which of Poole or Brazdakis lowers Michigan ceiling more? Losing which one lowers their ceiling more? I would say uh, Iggy. I would say <laughs> Iggy too because I think there's just more – like it's a more versatile piece. You can build out the rest of the rotation more effectively with him than without him. I agree. And I think I said this on the last pod, but I still think sophomore – Iggy Brasdakis can dominate college basketball more so than junior Jordan Poole. And I think Jordan Poole could be an outstanding player next year and and correct some of his shooting numbers and expand his game a little bit. But, like, I don't know if I envision him as a take over games, you know, take the t- put the team on his back and go win games and, and, and just completely dominate opposing teams. Like, I think... Ignis Brasdakis at this level, he could be that player. Yeah, I would say either of them could be. You'd probably, if you were handicapping it, give a higher percentage chance that Brasdakis could be. Right, right. That makes sense. Yes. Um, with Michigan, with with who Michigan State loses and brings in, do you see Izzo going back to his offensive style from the beginning of this year, or will they? See Stick with the half court ball screen offense that had so much success lately. I guess we kind of talked about this, but any lasting thoughts on that, or just go back I, to the start I, of the pod? I think they are sticking with what got them there. Their their thing will be kind of marrying all the things that they do. So it's going to be keeping the transition while also doing this ball screen stuff, and you know, I, I think just kind of evolving as an overall. Um, look of basketball if that makes sense yeah and i think ball screens are really powerful because you can kind of layer them and you can say that oh we have this ball screen offense but we're gonna do x y and z first in a possession and build off of what you have right like you still have to prepare to defend michigan's two guard offense even if they're just running a spread ball screen a lot Mm -hmm. of the times right Mm because you can kind of layer those things together so it really just makes michigan state even harder to guard in my opinion I'm on with that. Uh, there was one question I lost it, but it was basically that Michigan and Michigan State are number one on Bart Torvik and all of these preseason mm-hmm. polls. Number one and number two. Where do you do you buy that if everyone comes back? What do you make of? How would you, I guess, make sense of that? I lost the question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we're this is going to be the question for the next six months: is <laughs> are these really two the two best teams in America going into next season? And um, I mean, this podcast is just going to take, we're just going to go just next level nationwide. Um, I don't know. Good luck with that. I think, I think they, I think they certainly both have the potential to be, I anticipate them both being final four caliber teams next year. Um, Are they one and two? I don't care. I don't know. Um, But they, they have all the pieces to, even with some guys leaving. Um, now this, of course, if Cassius Winston leaves Michigan State, this changes the conversation completely. Um, but I think they're the most obvious picks. If you ask me to actually do one of these super too early, what are we? Th- this is crazy rankings that we're even doing this this early. Uh, if I had to do one of them, I'd probably yeah, I'd probably put Michigan, Michigan State in one order or the other. Probably Michigan State one, Michigan two, or something. Both in the top five for sure. Um, why wouldn't they be? Yeah, they both have probably the most solid 1-5 core, right. right? Like point guard, center, and then I guess figuring out what is in the middle of that is, I guess, where we're at, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of roster questions and stuff like that. I well, guess building off of that, someone asked, who will be the Michigan school's best competition in the Big Ten next year? Oh, I'm not even there yet. Um, shit. Um, remember when we used to talk about the rest of the Big Ten on this podcast? We've really given up on <laughs> on our uh, twelve friends. We're like, who who the hell are on those rosters? I, I yeah, what? I mean, um, uh, Jesus. I mean, I can tell you that no one Ohio else State picked, no be one else will be picked to. To win it, um, all right. Ohio State will be interesting. Jalen Smith is coming back to Maryland. Amir Coffey's already gone at uh, Minnesota. Um, Maryland, 
I assume they lose Br- Bruno, and that's it. So Maryland, yeah, Smith is coming back. Maryland's so yeah. likely that they're going to be three solid three. Purdue will be right there just because it's Purdue, and they're always right there at this point. Um, but man, losing Carson is a big oh blow. No, no, no doubt. But uh, Painter, no. I would trust Painter to exactly. coach any group of five guys against most every other coach in the Big Ten, except the two in Michigan. What about uh, Ohio State? Boys, team? Iowa? No, Indiana? Yeah, with our with our guy Jerome Hunter. Uh, I'm not buying into any of that sauce this time around. <laughs> well, Keep I, me as far away from that as you can. Has AO made any announcement from Illinois? I do not think so. Uh, I could see Illinois being pretty interesting if they're back intact. That's a that's a good team right there. A lot of Ohio State love mm-hmm. in the early ranking stuff. Uh, they bring in DJ Carton. Some of the young guys, I guess, could be... Better this time around. Caleb Weston back. Like, I, I don't know what to make of that team, but that's a team that a lot of people are high on. A lot of people are high on Holtman, and will always put him up there too. Yeah, like the national media just thinks that Holtman is, and, and he's a hell of a coach, and I think he's tremendous. A lot of national media members think that he's like an actual wizard or something. Really muscle him to that eight and twelve record this yeah, year. Exactly. Really close, strong down the stretch. <laughs> no, I, I think he's a very good coach. I just. Yeah, I have some. I need to see it to believe it. With I guess their roster at this le- at this level, yes, totally. Um, what do you think happens to Wisconsin? That's a scary uh, situation. I I think they'll be very solid. They strike me as like a figure out how to be a bubble team, right? Right. I mean, you have Trice, you have Davison. I think Rovers will be a breakout player for them. I think you're good enough to make the NCAA tournament, but I don't know if you're good enough to contend. Yeah. Like, what is Greg Gard without Ethan Happ? We're going to find out. Right. Uh, Iowa will be interesting. I assume Tyler Cook goes. Um, he declared you, already. He's yeah. already done. Um, but you bring in, you have a senior, Jordan Bahannon. Uh, Garza. You know, Garza, Isaiah Moss. Weiss Camp. Uh, I love Weiss Camp. And, you have uh, the another McCaffrey, right? Who's yeah. better coming in? Uh, something like that. I think he's highly regarded. Um, and the current McCaffrey will be a sophomore. Um, I'm going to guess that other... Iowa will be really good on offense and just absolutely terrible on defense. Uh, no, no, and they'll a, go about 500 and sneak into the NCAA tournament. Play <laughs> that, some crazy-ass games. That, and they'll that, do it all a, over again. That's a, that's a bold take. Maybe a late-season late, late season losing streak? <laughs> Just my hunch. What do you think about Richard's contract extension? Well, Milan likes to talk about how some teams have to go up to go down or go down for other teams to go up. I don't see Minnesota going up. I, I don't know what the like. What are you getting? They lose Coffee and Murphy. Coffee and Murphy isn't what's his name transferring to Isaiah Washington. Prayer graduate. Yeah. Well, that's a benefit. I don't disagree. I'm just saying the roster's not going to look anything like what it. Currently does. Jelly Fam will always have that February game at Chrysler where he just went crazy. That's right. But other than that, his career was a disaster there. I found it interesting that like a two-year deal for a guy losing his entire roster um, after spending much of the last couple years as being on the hot seat, or the proverbial hot seat, uh, is interesting. I mean, like, but and I, I know you got you got to give him an extension so that he can. It's recruit. also the the biggest trap scenario I think is a team that gets outscored in Big Ten play, makes the NCAA tournament, and wins a game. Mm-hmm. That's like the number one recipe to disappoint the following season. And you add in that they're gonna lose their two best players, and that can be really messy. Um, that's like exactly what happened to Northwestern, if you remember, right? Right, like. Mm-hmm. Northwestern wasn't actually that good, won a lot of close games, won the game in the tournament, everyone buys all into the story, and then they kind of regress where they're not actually that much worse, but they lose more close games, and then everything kind of goes to shit. Right, and this Minnesota, they they beat a Louisville team that lost eight of its last 12 games, was was picked in the preseason to finish in like the bottom third of the ACC, and that's probably pretty much what that 
team ended up uh, rounding into by the very end of the year. Um, but they, the Louisville, oh, the irony of ironies, Louisville ended up assuring that Richard Pitino had to get a, a contract extension, which is what a what a world. College basketball is the best. <laughs> I would love to hear. I mean, you look back; they lost. Seven of their last ten regular season games. Yeah, they were not. They were not good. If they lose that game to Purdue, is he fired? Like I, think, I don't. I mean, it's just crazy to think about how much that can change quickly. That's the thing. You think of how highly regarded we will always remember this Purdue team being. That and Minnesota beat them twice in the last two weeks of the season. Yeah, Purdue crazy. Yeah, it is. A, it's a. It was a weird year. It's a weird year when you like to everyone else. It probably just looks normal. Like if you didn't follow the Big Ten all year, right. like oh Purdue was a three seed, they went on this run. But it was a weird to see how kind of Big Ten teams manifested themselves in the tournament. Remember when Purdue lost to Notre Dame? <laughs> I do. We were, we were saying, will they even make the NCAA tournament? Yeah, they were six and five. Whoop! I I think this. I'm all in on Matt Painter after this year. I think he's. Easily one of the best coaches in the Big Ten. I think you, you know, in the country. Um, in the country. For sure. What about um, Mr. Hoiberg goes to Lincoln? I like it. I like it a lot. I think they'll, they'll be competitive. I loved how his Iowa State teams played. Mm-hmm. I think the way that I think it's, I guess you, I don't know if like humble is the right word, but it's like a smart fit for him, um, right? Like he probably could have got maybe a higher profile job. But I think the fact that he is like connections to there, he his style of recruiting fits for there. The expectations will fit for there. Right. I think it's a really right. a perfect situation and a total to go into. total roster turnover too. Like it is a blank slate. You know, there everyone's gone. Um, Glenn Watson's gone. Palmer's gone. Copeland's gone. Um, Roby could Roby declared, but could potentially. I think Roby be. I, yeah, I mean, it would be great for him to come back. So you say, you know have have one piece to kind of work around and but he gets to go recruit his types of guys that fit what they Thomas want to Allen do. Transferred, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, so, you mean he better get a few transfers in there. Uh real but, quick. But the point being like for a first year coach that knows what he wants to do, right, and knows what he wants it to look like, to be able to have like go get guys that actually fit what you want as opposed to having a roster of guys who have played one way for three or four years trying to figure out yeah, something completely might- different. You might want a few players on the roster, to wow. be fair. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Is it, I, I, Chris Holtman would tell you it's not, not always the worst thing to have a few guys waiting around that But it's like go you said about expectations. Like People aren't going to expect Hoiberg to go in and, and, and light the world on fire in his first year. Like he has more, He'll have more rope on that job than anyone in the league. It's not Brad Underwood going into Illinois being like, i got to take grad transfers because I need to win right away and blah, blah, blah. And then you get into this situation where – you're losing guys and restarting things, restarting your clock on the second year. Which for is, sure, for you know, sure. It'll, he'll, I think it's a great hire and a great fit. I'm excited yeah. to see what he does there. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? We got one more here. Okay. Do you think Yaklich or Sadi will get a head coaching job this offseason? Um, I would say the, the odds would say no. But that's strictly because there's only so few openings and there's so many candidates and it's really hard to get a head job. Um, I think I think Yaklich has a very good chance, though. Um, I'd be curious to see what else opens up. Um, he's talked to places. He's been in play at places already. Um, it, it hasn't hasn't worked out, but um, it's tough. It's when, when you're unsure what the next dominoes are going to fall. Is there a list of current openings right now? I, I don't have one handy. It's hard to know, like, like it's easy to say that if I was, like, a mid-major, I would want to hire him, but I'm, it's hard to know <clears throat> that the right scenario will come up at the right time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't – I mean, you look at, uh, I guess, the next dominoes that could fall would be Mick Cronin going to UCLA – where does Cincinnati hire and what does that open up? Like who, you know what I mean? Yeah. So little things like that can cause some of these shifts, but totally. I'm not, you also had a lot of jobs being filled a month ago. Right. And so the timing is a little tricky. 
So it looks like Arkansas is still open. UCLA, obviously. UCLA is not open. Oh, that's done. So Cronin's to UCLA. That's done. And Musselman is to Arkansas. Those are done. Those are done. Virginia Tech is still open? Virginia Tech hired uh, the Wofford coach, Mike Young. Jesus, CBS, update your website. Come on, guys. You got to post a <laughs> top twenty, a way too early top twenty-five. <laughs> uh, Get to this stuff later. Well, it'll be uh, you're interesting. Like, you're right though. Like a job like Cincinnati, they go hire in a a, a really good uh, mid-major coach. That's now a mid-major job that's open. That mid-major likely hires another mid-major coach, right? Um, and now that another job is open, and so on and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, Yaklich is very much a commodity right now, and he really he wants to be a head coach. Um, uh, Sadi's also a really interesting um, candidate and has had a ton of experience under two coaches who've won a ton of games, Campy and Beeline. Um, you know, it'd be it'd be interesting to see if any of the of the in state jobs actually opened up, but that doesn't appear to be happening. Um, I thought that there might be something happening at EMU maybe this year. What's Murphy's status there? I have no idea at this point. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if I had a, if I had a bet and it basically comes down to what I just said, that it's really hard to get a head coaching job, you know, you, you, your safe money would be on that, that they're all back. But um, there's always there's always a chance. He's, he's certainly a commodity. He's got an agent, you know, and we'll see. Yeah, no, what I always like, I just think back to whenever there's any kind of assistant coaching attrition or like kind of causes like mass panic, I would say it's probably generally a healthy thing for a program and new coaches bring new ideas, new changes, right? Like when Billy Donlin left, everyone was convinced that Michigan's defense was doomed the next week and then the recruiting, like it was just like a whole mass panic and then you look and you find some guy at two coaches at Illinois State and everyone's like what the hell is this turned out worked out all right right so mm-hmm. I think it's a healthy situation for the program to be in where if you're turning on coach a good coaches b you're probably hiring well and c you're empowering them to get other opportunities I would agree with that across the board I think people kind of lose the uh big picture on some of that mm-hmm um, all right. I think we, that's about it. I've been through most of this list. I'm at, I'm, I am nearing checkout time. <laughs> uh oh. You're kicking him out. You got to get out of there. Um, all right. Well, I guess we're still going to try to figure out what this thing actually looks like in the off season. Um, we're not going to go radio silent. Um, yeah, there'll be things to talk about, right? Sure. Sure. Um, and maybe we just do like kind of quick hit things as they come up, you know, like if there is an opening, you know, we just hit a quick episode with, all right, here are our thoughts on the opening and here's what we're hearing and blah, 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 blah. Um, once the rosters get more finalized, we'll be back with, with episodes on that. So um, we've, we've had a lot of questions of what's going to happen to the pod in, in the off season. Um, it certainly will not be um, a weekly deal and we'll probably won't have off season power rankings every week, but uh <laughs> Big changes. We'll just share the same list with you every week. We'll just get Brendan's golf takes. That'll, I mean, people tune now in for that, right? Now we're talking. Now we got some inside info. We got some the hot picks. That's right. That's right. One of the questions I got was, how many rounds of golf are you going to play per week now that the season's over? Uh, and my does Otis f- ever join you? No, Otis is blind and doesn't get around too well. He's he's an old dog, so I can't take him on the golf course. Um, but uh, man, last year, uh, I feel like last year I got up to like 60 rounds. Um, a grinder. Yeah. It will not be that many this year, mainly because I'll be working, uh, more. So, uh, I'll be on, on the road doing, doing stuff and it'll be less. My first round will be next Friday playing in an outing. Um, I'm getting a, a new driver I'm going in for a driver fitting this weekend. Just going to go piss away like 400 bucks just for the hell of it. Hey, you earned it. It's a long season. Get myself, you know, new, uh, 
new shiny object, which will be fun. Maybe add a couple yards to my feeble drives. Um, but we'll see. My back's been bothering me. I'm worried. I'm worried. But get back into summer shape here. In a long drive. I gotta go on a run, man. I haven't gone on a run in like four months, three months. Do you have a uh, total number of games you covered? No, I Do you have like a running tally? Too too many. It was uh, well, let's. I mean, how many? Teams? We don't. We don't. We don't have to calculate it I'm live not, on the. I'm air not adding. I'm not adding it up. I'm curious wh- how many games the two teams played combined. Um, let's see. Michigan State played 39 games. Michigan played 37. So. I'd probably say I only missed a handful for each, so I was probably up around 68 or 70 games this year, not including the, the exhibitions, but it was great. So we, we want to be sure to uh, thank all of you for uh, your your interest this season and uh, uh, kind of coming along for the ride with us. We, didn't, we weren't sure what this thing was going to be when we started it, and uh, uh, I think we're both really pleased with how – um, what it turned out to be. And we're just two guys who like talking basketball. This is the podcast is literally just like what Dylan and I would do at a bar after the game, any game that we would both be at. Um, we're just kind of, you know, bullshitting around. So, uh, that's all we really wanted it to be. And we were hoping that people would listen. And here we are all these months later and, uh, it was pretty well received and a lot of people yes. listened. Yeah. Thank you everyone for listening and giving us feedback along the way. It's been a fun ride, but we're not we're not stopping the podcast. We'll keep it going, like we said. So don't don't freak out. <laughs> yeah, I'll be covering Michigan and Michigan State next year. And uh, Dylan, I imagine you'll uh, still be tuned in on your end, right? We will. Okay, <clears throat> we'll still be here. Well, keep it rolling. Awesome stuff. Subscribe to UM Hoops. Subscribe to the Athletic. Tip your bartenders and your servers, and enjoy your off season. Thanks, everyone.